Good evening, and thank you for joining us this evening. It wasn't that I was muted. We just wanted to make sure we were set up in this room because we have both Mr. Hagopian and Mrs. Hawley answering questions today. So just like we've done with every other presentation, if you do have a question because I say something and it immediately pops into your head, we ask that you use the chat function to Mrs. Hawley or to Mr. Hagopian and they will answer your question. If we see a trend in questions, like we've done every other time, I will answer them at the end of the presentation. If I can't answer your question, which is possible, we'll get back to you or we'll add it to the presentation before it's posted on um, the website. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started. Okay. So I feel like for our full remote, teachers and for our full remote parents, um, this may be an even more anxious time than for our students who are returning to the building and the parents of those students and the teachers. You see, they all have something to anchor themselves to. They know what school is like. Um, their kids, even though school will be different, know what the classroom is like. And for you, as the parents of students who will be fully remote, and truthfully, our, for our teachers who will be fully remote, acknowledging that they are well aware that this full remote program will not be like what occurred in the spring. Um, th there's anxiety. And what I ask for each and every one of you, just like I ask for each and every one of our teachers, is to have patience, to give yourselves the grace um, to accept imperfection in the beginning because it is going to be imperfect. I will not stand in front of you right now and say, this is gonna be the best thing ever on September 8th because the fact is, it's gonna be messy. And my goal and my hope and what I hope for each, that each of you will embrace is that on September 9th, it will be better. And on September 10th, it will be even better. And on October 16th, even better. That's where we, how we move forward. So I do want to address the concerns about why, if you are in the full remote program, you need to stay in until the end of the first marking period. Uh, there are many school districts that are treating their full remote students as visitors to the classroom, meaning the hybrid model is occurring and students are just streaming in. I have several friends who work in a neighboring district and they began that yesterday and it's really hard. And I believe that our full remote students deserve the same focused teaching that our hybrid students deserve. To do that, um, it's all a game of numbers and it's all a game of personnel. And if people are leaving and coming in the middle, it changes my staffing. And what happens is I find myself needing to hire staff, which is fine, but trying to hire staff in five days is not very easy if we want high quality staff members. And we also will land up in a position where I'll immediately be furloughing staff because I suddenly won't need them in an environment. So the, the transition period that we're using is very consistent with the majority of Bergen County. Um, I can think of one district in the county that is not using this and is using a 10 day. Um, their, their kids are going back to different schools in different spots. And um, for us right now, this is the plan. And on October 9th, then we'll, look, we'll think about things again. And at the end of the first marking period, we'll think about things again. As I said in our reopening webinar, these are the six tenants that guide us this year. And I really want to talk about consistency as key. The reason that our full remote students are in cohorts is because our hybrid students are in cohorts. We want the programs to mirror each other. It's why the schedule for the day is similar. Um, we're treating our full remote program as if it's another class. The room for that class just doesn't happen to be at Oradell Public School right now. We also really want to assure you that in terms of adult learning, yes, there's a lot of adult learning that's going to have to take place for our teachers. And we've been doing that for the past three days and we are committed to continuing to do that. And I know that there's a lot of adult learning that you may feel you need as a parent. Some of the classroom videos that I will talk about that are being created by Ms. Mrs. Lynch will help you as a family too. And we are 
still brainstorming a way for families, especially in K-1-2, who are really nervous about Google Classroom or third grade, that we may be able to give you um, a class outside um, if you're comfortable coming into the auditorium where we can socially distance you, um, doing it in there because it, one of the hardest things to do is to teach a technology skill like Google Classroom while you're actually on your computer at the same time. So let's talk about what live time looks like. So in our hybrid model, we talk about on-site time and we talk about remote time. And in our, our full remote model, I keep struggling with the language. So sometimes I'm going to say cohort time. That means when your cohort is live and non-cohort time. So right now I am talking about your live cohort time. So if you're in a kindergarten, first or second grade classroom, this is the schedule on the left-hand side for if you're in the A cohort. So you're going, your child is going to log into their Zoom call at 8.30. They will remain in that Zoom call until 11 o'clock. During the that time, this is the approximate breakdown that will happen for instruction. So for example, when it comes to 8.55, the teacher may say, boys and girls, it's time for reading. Let's take out the books that we're working on, or let's go to Epic and pick one of the books that you're going to be reading today. Um, there will be opportunities for you to get some books from OPS if you don't have access to them at home, or if your child is struggling with digital reading, because it is, for some kids, it's the best thing ever, and for some kids, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, once that teacher teaches the lesson, your children will work on that work right there at the computer, okay, at that table, at that desk. We're not bouncing around the room. This is just like they are in the classroom. They've had the lesson. Now they're going to work right there. The teacher may ask a follow-up question. I'll talk a little bit about how the teacher might put them in a breakout room in a few slides. When we get to recess, there's three different possibilities for this time. But what I have said to teachers in the beginning is your K-1-2 students, students in the upper grades, they're going to be on, on a computer from 8.30 to 11. And as much as I'd like to give them some free time to talk on that computer and have recess and interact with their peers in a less structured way, I actually right now would like them to get up and move around. So, They'll stay in their Zoom call. They don't have to log out of it because we don't want the added stress of having to log back in. But I encourage teachers at this time to say to your child, go for a walk, run around the house, get a snack, whatever it is because they've just been sitting for an hour and they're going to be sitting again for another hour and 15 minutes. So for the beginning right now, it may look like that. We have talked about weaving in some SEL activities during that time. But again, we're still sitting. And, and I really do want to encourage that our stamina for learning is going to be low in the beginning of the year. It's going to be low on site. It's going to be low for our full remote students because school was different for three months. So while September is always tough when we come back, you know, I tell the story of being a first grade teacher and having children fall asleep at their desk at the end of the day. Um, it's going to be even more difficult right now. If your child is in the B cohort in K1 or 2, they will log on to their computer at 1230. They will stay in that Zoom call until 3 o'clock. In grades 1 and 2, there will be another 60 minutes of asynchronous activity that your child can do at any point in time. You can call that homework, but you're home all the time, so I'm not sure that's the work either. It's the additional learning work. So that additional learning work will be a little bit of what homework looks like. It'll be read independently for X amount of time. Do your go math work. Um, work on some added IXL activities. Um, work on your foundations practice for that day in word study. Um, it may be continue doing something in science and social studies in the upper grades. Uh, and in terms of specials, Okay. I wasn't going to talk about specials today because uh, I haven't talked about specials with the whole community. So you're getting a sneak peek 
at, at specials and there will be more information shared with the entire community. So one of our real focus points was how do we streamline specials so that you weren't looking for 14 different Zoom links. So what our special area teachers have done, one second there. is there is a separate special area website. So when you go to that special area website, it will tell, remind your child of exactly what time their special is. And this link right here, every Monday, Mrs. Albrecht, Ms. Pease, Ms. Tajian's A class at 2.30 has library. They click on that link. That is the link for library every single week. Okay, specials are being run five days a week, not on a six day cycle. That's part of why our special area classes will seem a little bit bigger, but I felt that it was more important to provide consistency right now and to say to you, is it an A day or a B day? Are you the A cohort? Are you the B cohort? And to also ask you to think about is library a C day, a D day, an E day, an F day? It, it seemed like alphabet soup. So we are running specials on a five day schedule for the first time in many years. And our specials will be a combination of live and recorded lessons. So in third grade, everything is live except for the second physical education class as all students have two PE classes a week. You can do the second physical education class whenever you'd like your child to do it. Okay. In kindergarten, all classes will start in the first marking period as recorded lessons. So you can decide when your child should do that recorded lesson. In first grade, it's a combination of recorded and live lessons. Physical education, world language, and art will be live streamed classes, music and library will be recorded lessons. And that's how we're going to start for the first marking period. Uh, students will, and I'll answer this later, have access and the ability to, to order books from the library and you'll be able to come and pick them up at OPS. There are no special area classes for the first two days of school. I, as I watched our staff the last three days and, and I felt my own stress and anxiety rising, I realized that for this community, I truly believe that gradually increasing things into next week is in our best interest. So specials will start on Thursday. Um, if you ha want to have your child do something, have them draw a picture for their teacher. Have them draw a picture for Mrs. Bocanfuso. Um, have them read a little bit more. Have them compose a song, whatever it is those first two days. Grade three, this is your cohort day. So if you were in the hybrid model, this would be your on-site day. So you start with homeroom and at 8.30, you're gonna log into your Zoom call and you're gonna stay there until 12.40 and you're going to work through your day. Again, the same thing with that break. Right now, it may be move, get around, move around for a little bit. We may move to making that break time an SEL activity for 15 minutes and then move around for 15 minutes. Now, that's when you're, if you're in the A group, this is your A day. Now, if you're in the A group, this is your B day. You are still gonna connect every morning to a Zoom call at 8.30, even when it's your non-cohort day, because you're going to listen to the read aloud and have a live stream reading workshop lesson. So the teacher will finish reading and say to you boys and girls, um, or say to your child, um, hey readers, today we're going to learn how to pay attention to what a character does and what that tells us about the character. The teacher will teach that direct explicit lesson to your child remotely and to the children in front of them. 
at the end of that lesson, the teacher will say, so the work you're going to do today is you're going to continue working on looking at your book for characters' actions and how that character's actions help you infer about the character. I'll see you this afternoon. Your child will exit the Zoom call and begin to pay attention to the rest of their day. And that rest of their day from 915 to 1240 is going to be their recorded um, or live special area class, a recorded writing lesson. That will be an OPS teacher teaching that writing lesson. It will be the same recorded lesson that students in the hybrid model are using. That's part of how we're encouraging consistency across a grade level because it shouldn't matter if you're hybrid or remote, the teaching points and the style of teaching and the pacing of teaching should be the same. So teachers will share responsibility across the grade level for making the recorded videos. So it may be one week in third grade, Ms. Pisa records the videos. The next week, Mrs. Albrecht records the videos. The next week, Ms. Tajian records the videos. The next week, Mrs. Sheridan and then Mrs. Kaminsky. There is a slight possibility that that sometimes will flip-flop. Writing will be live and reading will be recorded. In math, we'll continue to use Go Math videos or Mr. Math blog to do the direct explicit teaching students will work on their assignment. The difference between now and, and what happened in the spring is their teacher will follow up each and every day on that math lesson. So at 1.30, after the teacher is done working with the cohort students for that day, so, or if they were in the hybrid, the on-site students, so it's an A day at 1.30, the teacher's going to meet with just the B cohort students. And at 1.30, the teacher's going to say, let's look at what you accomplished today. Let's go over your math work. If reteaching is necessary because students struggled with a concept, the teacher's going to reteach it. As I said in the opening, um, our reopening webinar, it's a bit of a flipped classroom. It allows the teacher to teach what's necessary at that point in time. The teacher may also, it's 50 minutes, so the teacher may also, it actually should be the 220 because it's actually 50 minutes, not 40 minutes. And the teacher will also perhaps say, let's share some of your writing today because the reading already happened in the morning. The teacher has a better grasp on what your child did as a reader. The literacy assignment, when I use that language, because I know we get stuck in educational jargon, that typically means a grammar assignment, a vocabulary assignment, it could be spelling, um, something along those lines. Grades four and five, this is your cohort day. So if you're A, this is your A day. If you're B, this is your B day. You're gonna, again, log in at 8.30. You're gonna stay in your Zoom call until 12.40. And this is your non-cohort day. So if you're in the B cohort, um, this is what happens for you on an A day. So on Friday, September 11th, that's a B day. So this is what the A students will be working on. And again, um, for both our hybrid program and our full remote program, this Zoom call at the end of the day, these, this 50 minutes of live time is a way to try to create consistency between the days when you're fully live and the days when you are working more independently. But we know at the end of the day, A, there's some teacher, there's accountability for the student. What did you get done? But there's also a chance to teach anything that the student struggled to learn independently that day. Grade six, um, you do know you're also getting question and answer, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, just checking. Um, so in grade six, this is what our day looks like. Okay. And I do want to, um, I did send out an, an email about this, but for parents, I only sent it to families who were already um, enrolled in the full remote program. Um, so if you were not enrolled in the full remote program and you've gone in since then, uh, fourth and fifth grade, unlike what's happening in our hybrid models, there is one teacher 
And we made that decision in conjunction with the teachers who said, we just think it's better for kids at that, that age and for parents to only have one person to need to contact. In sixth grade, our remote program does look a little bit different from our hybrid program because in sixth grade, in the hybrid program, so if you're coming in person to OPS, your one teacher would teach language arts, your other teacher would teach, excuse me, Rami. Nicola. Nicola, sharing has been paused. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yep. Um, so if you're in the sixth grade program on site, what's going to happen is you would have one teacher for language arts and one teacher for math, science, and social studies. If you're in the full remote program, we felt having one teacher teach all content area at that level um, was a lot. Um, it's sixth grade. It's really a middle school grade. Uh, so Ms. Shaw will teach only mathematics. Uh, to not have Ms. Cataldo teach science or social studies when that's what she did all last year um, doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of using an individual's strengths. And this will allow, by only teaching one subject area, Ms. Shaw will actually still be able to support some of our academically talented students throughout the school. And this is what would happen in sixth grade on a non-cohort day. So you're in the A group, this is your B day. When I say assignment versus a um, Zoom call, assignment is something we call asynchronous. Um, you're not all doing it at the same time, even though here in the schedule, my goal is that students will do it at this time. That's where I'm going to need some of your help to make sure you're saying to your child, no, this is your schedule and this is your time, especially because they need to, when they meet with their Zoom, their teacher at 210, they do need to have their work done, okay? There may be some, thing, some extra pieces they didn't get to, but it's really hard for the teacher to check on what they've done if it's not been done yet. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about materials, okay? Um, the hallways of OPS look like, uh, like a delivery center right now. Um, you can only see a little bit on this picture of one folding table, but right now in the hallways, there are 10 folding tables. Um, on those folding tables are a plastic bin for every single one of our full remote students. What we've spent the past three days doing is putting the materials we anticipate you will need for the first marking period into that bin. Now, is it possible it's gonna come up that you're gonna need to come back here and get something? Yes, because we don't know what all of a sudden October comes, or I'll use Ms. Cataldo for uh, an example. I know that she has some hands-on science lessons she's planning on doing, and she hasn't had time yet to finish putting together the bags of materials for those lessons. So when those moments come up, we will, say, we will send out a blast and say, over the next three days, please stop by OPS. There is in the enclosed lobby, there is a bin please pick up a bag of materials from that bin for your child. So on Friday, you will come to the front of OPS. There will be a folding table outside with several administrators and whoever else we can rope into helping us. And at nine o'clock, if you're in pre-K or kindergarten, you will come and pick up your materials. If you have a child in kindergarten and you also have a child in second grade, you may pick up kindergarten and second grade at the same time. We don't need for you to have to come back and forth four times. It just might take us an extra second because outside we will have kindergarten, pre-K and kindergarten, but on our tables inside, we will have the other grades. So we'll just run in and get that basket for you for second grade or fourth grade, whatever it is. You will be t picking up technology too if you need it. Now we did send out a survey asking our remote parents um, if your child is in need of technology. If you don't need it, I, I ask that you don't take it because uh, as you know, we are waiting for one uh, shipment, one order of technology to come in. So some of the devices that if you don't need, help me to deal with some of our K-1 students where we're lacking in some devices. We will make sure that everyone who needs a device gets one, okay? 
um, we just ask that we hope that you've filled out the survey and communicated that to us because that's what we've put in our bins. If it's not there and you still need one, we'll run in and we'll get something. It'll just take a little bit longer and we won't get to be as efficient as um, we'd like to be. On site also will be the PTA. There, your PTA supply box is here if you've ordered one, as is your memory book from last year. So again, um, chances are at some point during the first marking period, I'm going to ask that you come back and pick up some other materials because I think what we'll find is we thought of the calculator, we thought of the base 10 blocks, we thought of the ruler, we thought of this, and all of a sudden we're going to get to a unit and go, we didn't think of that. Uh, in K1 and 2, I anticipate it could be when we get to nonfiction writing. When we do writing workshop in K1, the paper looks different for fiction writing or narrative writing than it does for nonfiction writing because nonfiction writing typically has um, boxes in different spots. So we may say, come pick up a bunch of paper. So um, how are you going to get feedback? Because, you know, that was the concern in the spring. You know, my child did the work, but how did I know if they were doing it well? And, and so that's what we keep looking at. We keep looking at what are the platforms we can use that give feedback without creating stress and anxiety? And I, if you had a sixth grader in the spring, uh, we thought we did this really great thing and we were going to have a virtual field day where kids had to video themselves doing an event and upload that video. Unless uploading that video became challenging for parents and then what was meant to be fun turned into stress. And so when we're giving feedback, we want to make sure that all the effort goes into giving quality feedback, not in how to upload the materials. So one new application we'll be using in grades three through six is called GoFormative. And it allows students to um, answer in, in a very quick fashion so the teacher can see everyone's answer at one time and inform future teaching. We also uh, are, one of the reasons we're using Go Google Classroom in grades K through two is to have a feedback loop. So one of the things you can do in Google Classroom is you can, there's an app for a phone or an iPad um, and it will allow you to take a picture of student work and the teacher can easily see it and provide feedback on it. We're not going to get there on September 11th. So I ask that you allow the beginning of the year to be about routines and protocols and building rapport with your class. And if you anything about school psychology, it's a bit like Maslow's hierarchy. We need to deal with our, our physical needs first. We need to deal with our emotional. Well, in this case, we're dealing with operations. Okay, We're dealing with protocols. We're dealing with emotional connection then we're dealing with high quality instruction. So I'm not saying it's gonna take us till October, but it's gonna take us a little bit to get there. Okay. The other piece that, as I shared during the opening uh, webinar, is the district has purchased an educational account of Zoom. Um, part of the reason it was important to me is as the administrator of that account, I will be able to see everyone what Zoom calls are happening. And that's really important to me because I can join them then. Uh, I saw a student today and I was really happy to get to say to her, I'm still going to see you even if you're in the full remote model. Uh, there are still students at OPS and I want them to know that their relationship is not just with their teacher, but it's also with their principal. So the account does that. It also has some other enhanced features in terms of being to poll students and ask them a question and do you understand? Um, and we're also going to be using breakout rooms more. What a breakout room does is it allows the teacher to not have to set up a separate Zoom call to work with three kids, but I've taught my writing lesson. Okay, it's my live, it's my live day. I'm in the B group. It's a B day. I've just taught the class writing and I've said, okay, everyone get to work. But now I might say, okay, you know what? Um, Johnny, Jenny, and Jake, I'm going to put you in a breakout room right now and, and I'm going to work just with those students. Okay, that's part of how we get to personalized instruction. Okay, let's talk about miscellaneous questions. Um, 
how do I know my child's cohort? I, I did realize that some people who were in the full remote program thought that by being in the full remote program, they would be uh, getting live instruction four hours a day, five days a week. That's not really fair because hybrid students aren't getting that. So we're mirroring the hybrid program in, uh, we're mirroring the full remote program to the hybrid program. So if your last name is Ada Lee, you're in cohort A. If your name is LEI to Z, you're in cohort B. Um, if your child's in a special education program or you requested a change and it was granted, you were notified by administration. We are in the process, when I go into the parent portal, so I say, let me see a child's parent portal, I actually see their cohort. I had a parent send me their view last night because they didn't understand why uh, a parent couldn't see it. And I learned that your side doesn't see it. So I've reached out to our student management system to see how I can add that feature to the parent portal. What is the size of a cohort? Average cohort size is 13 to 16. On site, it's 12. Um, if enrollment numbers become a concern, we're going to revisit it just like we do in a classroom. We've already done that. The number for third grade, we planned to have one teacher teaching third grade full remote. The teacher was going to have 12 students in the morning, 12 students, 12 students on an A day, 12 students on a B day, because that's what our projections showed. Those of you who said, yes, we're interested, we're considering this, that's about where the numbers were. When we asked you to commit, the number went up in that grade. I was uncomfortable with the size of the cohort, so I added another B section. So we have one, a, one cohort on the A, and two on the B. If we need to do that in another grade, we actually based, did the same thing in second grade. We were originally planning to have one teacher, A in the morning, B in the afternoon, same thing. Expectations, that's where the projections were when the enrollment came in, in that grade as well. It went up, we added a section. If we need to do that in other spots, we will do that. Uh, what you need to understand about that though, so let's say you're in fourth grade right now and there are 13 kids in the A group and 14 kids in the B group. Give me one second. I'm having a hard time focusing. Thank you. This is like being in a classroom. I had to tell the back of the class to take it down a notch. Um, so we have, say you have 13 kids in the A group and 14 kids in the B group and suddenly 10 more kids decide to join. Let's make it smaller. Five more kids decide to join and I'm uncomfortable. I'm going to change children's classrooms. The protocol I will use for that, I haven't decided, but if, I'm, if the concern is the class is too small, too big, I'm going to have to move children out of it. That's why consistency is key, because the teacher you're starting with this year, whether you're on site or whether you're remote, may not be the teacher you're ending with. And that's going to be really hard. I understand that. But that's why deadlines and expectations are important. Because if you emailed me today and you said, you know what, I've changed my mind and I want to go into full remote, okay? I then moved a student out of hybrid to go into full remote. That's okay, right? But now I've left one boy in that class in the, in the hybrid model, okay? Everything's tweaking. Now I only have four kids in that class in the hybrid model. Maybe I want to make that class go away and add another class to the remote model. You're going to need to be flexible. You're going to need to trust in all staff at Oradell Public School. And my staff knows they have to be consistent because this is a possibility. So in terms of the first two days of school when there's no specials, um, you have a bunch of options. You can draw a picture, you can always read. Uh, and I always want you to remember the OPS website has a gazillion links. The front page of the website still has the summer learning links. It still has the library links. Got a little excited there, I think. Um, how will I know if my K2 student has homework? Uh, again, I would call, it's the asynchronous learning of the day and your child's teacher will communicate that with you. I don't want to say how they're going to communicate it because I believe it's going to be on a website, but I, I know that sometimes for kindergarten, it may be an email blast to, to a parent. Will students have access to the school library? Yes. Mr. Mangle has created a, two different systems. One is for K2 students, one is for 3-6 students. Uh, in the K2 student model, he will 
ask children to choose a book from a group of topics and he'll put that book aside. We'll have you come here on a day and pick it up from outside. In grades three through six, when your child wants a book and he will go over this with them because he will go over the same exact thing with students who are on site because they won't be going into the library. Instead of delivering books to the table outside of OPS, he will be delivering books to a table outside their classroom. So if your child is in fifth grade and adores the Rick Riordan, a series like The Lightning Thief, and wants the second one, they will have a structure to email um, Mr. Mangle and he will deliver it to them. Is that for me? I'm at 18, I might should be okay. Will there be concert band? There will be instrumental lessons for students in grades five and six. We will add fourth grade. I just think we needed to wait a little bit because uh, for students on hybrid who have two teachers, for your students who are fully remote and are navigating things, Mr. Butcher and I have agreed that we will start instrumental lessons and they will happen like they occurred last year. However, we'll hold off to at least the end of the first marking period to begin fourth grade instrumental. How will TAG work? There will be a talented and gifted website and we're also working to integrate a live component. That's part of why um, Ms. Sham is only teaching math in sixth grade. Will there be science lab? Yes, science lab will be a recorded lesson. It will be a different lesson each week and it will be a different lesson for third grade. It'll be a different lesson for fourth grade. It will be a different lesson for fifth grade and sixth grade. Okay. It will be launched every Wednesday morning in one set location. The, that is serving two purposes. One, it's getting science lab in, but it's also going to provide our teachers with an extra half hour to meet together each week, which if we want consistency, I need to be able to build into our structures and our operations. In grades K2, there will be a STEM activity launched every week. And the reason I asked Ms. Keener to go in the area of STEM is we have a lot of screen time going on and I wanna make sure our kids are doing things with their hands. PTA will continue to run the activities they've run in the past uh, remotely. Uh, I talked a little bit about how students work will be evaluated. And yes, if you are um, a K2 student, there may be times when we ask you to bring some work in uh, just as we're getting ourselves built up in Google Classroom in grades K through two. And how much parent assistance is expected in K and one? Well, you're probably gonna have to help them log into the Zoom call. And what I would expect is that basket of materials, it should be right by them. And that's part of your job. It's part of the assistance you give your child to make sure they have all their materials right there, okay? And then the fact is, you're the prompter. The teacher's teaching. You're the prompter of you're not sitting down because that's going to be a little bit hard for the teacher if your child's suddenly over here and out of screen. So you may need to, if they're working in a set location somewhere, you may need to check on them and make sure they're sitting in front of their screen. That's a really important part of this year and a difference between last year. And I will talk a little bit more about behavioral expectations in a moment. Uh, in terms of helping our students uh, build their technology skills quickly, Mrs. Lynch will be streaming and, cre and creating recorded lessons for all grade three classes, both on site and remote, um, on the cohort day, on the day that students are. It's an A day. Your social studies lesson is actually going to be a study skill, Google Classroom, how do you do this technology lesson? Uh, that will happen for the first two weeks of school. Then we're going to see where we are and what else we need. We know that for our full remote students, it's probably going to need to keep going because their reliance on technology is going to be greater than students in the hybrid model. Mrs. Lynch is also creating videos for teachers to use in grades four through six. They also will probably use them during science and social studies time, the first couple, uh, the first week and a half. And that's cleaning out your emails from last year, organizing your Google Drive from last year so that the cumbersomeness of the past doesn't interfere with the efficiency of this year. And students in grades K through two, we're gonna work on the Zoom piece first. We will begin to integrate Google Classroom and we will integrate, we'll begin to teach you that part as well. 
So behavioral expectations. Um, some of you have heard the story about the email I got in the spring from a parent. And he said to me, um, not to be too personal, but it, we had just gone to uh, stay at home orders. He said, do you work in your pajamas? And I said, it's a little bit of a weird question, but some of you know that I, I have a half hour commute each day. So the only benefits to remote learning for me was that I could wear my pajamas and I could sleep in and I shared that with him and I said, why? And he believed and he told his daughter that if you're going to be efficient, you should get dressed each day. He said, do you think Miss Bosius wears her pajamas when she's working? And they agreed that whatever I did would be the expectation in that house. So that was a very happy sixth grader because she spent the spring working in her pajamas. However, she would be getting dressed this year. I need for our students to understand, A, that this is different than the spring, and B, this is school. So children are going to be dressed for school. There's going to be a dedicated spot for your child to work, and it's not going to be their bed. So your homework this weekend is figuring out where is that spot in this house. You need to make sure that in that spot, you have learning materials there. We shouldn't be getting up and searching for a pencil. Okay, this is school. This is work. This is your spot. You have the materials you need at your spot. We're not going to eat breakfast, lunch, or dinner while learning. You're not going to deliver Johnny's snack during the writing workshop lesson because that wouldn't happen on site and that's not going to happen in our full remote model. Pets are not coming to class. We're not going to have dogs that we're petting. We're not bringing the lizard. And siblings are not coming to class. I'm not going to see babies on children's laps. Yes, all of this happened in the spring and it's not going to happen now because this is school. And we have to set these protocols up from the beginning. And I'm also going to ask that you don't come to school with your child. Okay, I get it in K-1-2, you might need to be near. But sixth grade parents, you don't come to math class. You're enabling your children not to be independent. You've chosen this model. You believe that they're going to be successful in it. I believe that they're going to be successful in it. So let's set the expectation. You will be successful. This is what's going to happen. In terms of tardiness, and that was a question asked that I just realized wasn't here, we will treat it like we do um, on site. In many of our classes, fourth grade and fifth grade, and I think sixth grade as well, we start the whole class together each morning, third grade definitely. Um, you, so if you're late at 8.30, the teacher's going to mark you late, just like they would at Oradell Public School. And we're going to keep track of those lates because that's what our student management system does. It tracks, it tracks tardiness. It tracks attendance. If your child's late more times than we believe is appropriate, you're going to get the same letter you would get if your child was on site. You're going to have the same conversation with an assistant principal or if it's not, if you're like, listen, I'm talking to my sixth grader and he's not listening, then he's going to have that, con he or she will have that conversation with an assistant principal. Um, that's why, so they'll be taking care of attendance. K2, if you're in the B model, I have to do a little bit of work with our student management system to figure out um, attendance, okay? So I will get back to you on that. The next blast that's coming from me or the email from, or the letter from the superintendent, I, there's two things coming out and I'm a little confused on what's in which one right now. So the students coming on site need to complete a daily attestation each day. Our remote students also need to complete a daily attestation each day. Just because you're coming in this build, not coming in this building, I, I do need to know that your child is healthy. Um, and if you're a kindergarten or sixth grade parent and you have not handed in your child's vaccination records, I cannot allow you to begin school on Tuesday. It's the county's law. It doesn't matter about entering the building. You're not allowed to be on the roll of Oradell Public School if you have not submitted proper vaccination records. And I will share with you that we used to be able to say to the county, but look, they have a doctor's appointment and the county would be okay. Last year when we tried that, when the county came in to do our audit, um, I had to remove two students from class. So please make sure your vaccination records are in. If it's not your well visit time, I get it. But most doctor's offices will let you make an appointment without it being your well visit if you haven't. Um, had the vaccination. So 
Next week is not going to be perfect. Um, Pre-K classes are going to begin on Tuesday. Pre-K through grade two are going to be on, begin on Tuesday. Cohort B will begin on Tuesday. Um, the week of 9-14 is our first virtual Wednesday, and there is a different schedule for that. It will be shared with you um, from your homeroom teacher. What's different in grades three through six on virtual Wednesday is the cohorts are together. And that's just so that they build a larger feeling of community and, and see other people. So I guess at this point, I'm going to ask Ms. Mrs. Hawley and Mr. Hagopian if they have any questions they would like me to address because they were, oh. Okay. And while Mr. Hagopi is coming here, I'm just going to make a personal plea. Um, I know you're stressed and I know you're nervous and no matter how much information I give you, it's never going to be enough. I just ask that you maintain open lines of communication with the school and I ask that you stop being the Lorax. Um, in other words, if, if there's an issue and, and you feel it, email me and say that. Don't email me things like many people are saying because many people aren't emailing me. And if you don't have, to, I'm going to leave remote learning up that email address because it's working a little more efficiently than you emailing me directly because all three administrators are monitoring it. But if you don't tell me there's a problem, I can't solve it. So for example, uh, for our, yesterday I sent out a blast or whenever my last blast was, right? Um, I got a, an email from a, a parent. She's like, Facebook wants to know where kids are being dropped off for drop up, at drop off and pick up locations. Now one parent's asked me that question. I can't answer a question if I don't know it's a problem and that information hasn't been clarified. So if there's something you need to know, I may not have the answer, but I'll get back to you. Um, ask it to me, ask it to Mr. Hagopi and ask it to Mrs. Hawley. Stop asking it to each other and turning I statements into many people statements. Okay, speak for you. Take care of your child right now and don't hide behind many people statements. We have a question about how we're going to do back to school night for our mm -hmm. remote families. Okay, so in terms of the question was, how will we do back to school night for our remote families? Well, back to school night will be virtual, most likely for all families at Oronel Public School. Um, I do need to have a conversation with the superintendent because I may move it a few days. So I, I need to do some thinking about that. But you would get a Zoom link and your teacher would present to you just like the teachers here would present. Our classrooms aren't going to handle, uh, let's say there's 12 people in a, more, in a A group and 11 people in a B group. I can't put 23 people in a classroom. I wouldn't put 23 students in a classroom. So it would be a remote presentation at a set time. You would have opportunities to listen to your child's curriculum and to ask the, ch the teacher questions. We had a few questions about the TAG program. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in, in K2, um, in, okay, so the question was about the TAG program, and as I said in the presentation, it is a work in progress. Right now, we know that there will be a TAG website with activities for students to do. We are right now looking at the schedule to see how to add um, a Zoom call for students who have qualified in, so students in grades four, five, and six, in to, to meet with Ms. Sean. Grade three, I will screen you, but not yet. So instead of doing our screening in September of grade three, we won't screen our students till later into the year. And we will have to recreate our, um, our metrics for assigning in because, actually I don't have to because I can use the fall Linkit scores into that. So it will be after students have taken fall Linkit, um, I will set up a time. I can give the COGATs remotely, I would prefer not to. So that's a conversation I will have with our full remote families who are, have third graders um, 
to see if we can create a situation where someone might be comfortable bringing their child in to take the CODAT. For the validity and reliability of that test, um, I wouldn't be incredibly comfortable um, provide, giving it in a remote setting. In K-1-2, we will do just what we always have. Ms. Shaw will work with a class, a, a class, not a group of students in one and two. It would just be a class activity. You're what we're walking into. Okay, so the question was how many students are remote versus in school? Uh, right now, um, no, it's higher than that. It's higher than that. So we have approximately 750 students at Oradell Public School. We have approximately 199 students at last check in the full remote program. I do actually think I might have added one today, which would make it an even 200. Um, so I'll, I'll let you do the math on that one. Mm -hmm. So in terms of if you have a child who ha has special education, uh, speech, speech will be remote for all students, okay? So uh, unless you're in the pre-K program, uh, Ms. Kalakin is going to go into the pre-K, but in this case, if you are remote and you're in the pre-K program, it would be a virtual session with her. In the case of OT and PT, it's a conversation you'll have with your case manager. You could come on site just for that related service if you feel that OT or PT in a remote setting wasn't effective for your child. But speech will continue to be um, remote and for the first two weeks of school, OT and PT will be remote because I am waiting for um, the plexiglass pieces um, to finish their treatment areas with. If it is not your cohort day, you have a question, can the child email the teacher or do they have to wait until the afternoon meeting to register? That's a great question. If it's your cohort day, can the child email the teacher? If it's not your, if it's not your cohort day. So it's... Um, it's an A day and your child's in the B cohort and they're working in the morning, can they email the teacher? They can email the teacher. I cannot guarantee you that the teacher will have time to answer. They may have time during that recess break to look quickly and answer something, but I can't guarantee if it comes after that time, I need the teacher focused on the students who are live with them at that time. So if answering the email is gonna interfere with the live time, my guidance to teachers will be do not answer it at that time. And that's why that 50 minutes at the end of the day is so important. What I would encourage your children to do is if they get to something and they're stuck, email the question, okay, work on something else and see if, if that answer comes back. And if not, I actually can talk to staff about checking their email before they meet with the cohort in the afternoon so they know ahead of time these were some of the struggles. When should parents expect to receive um, their initial like logins for the okay. class? So the question was, when will parents, when should parents be expected to receive their it, logins for Google Classroom? It's my understanding that third grader teachers will be weaving that in right away. Fourth through sixth grade already have them. Um, I know that we were working on pre-K today. Um, I would end K. So. We, I anticipate since K12, that's 31, 16, about 50 people. Um, it's the distribution of it to you that I have to work on. So I think I can get that done by uh, the 11th, by September 18th. Um, and again, K12 for those first two weeks, we're really focusing on the Zoom part. So uh, the Google Classroom part coming a little bit. I'll, I think I'll do it backwards. We'll start with second grade first and we'll work down because kindergarten, your Google Classroom part is going to be the least important right now. We're gonna do a lot more of sharing. Um, I mean, the beginning of kindergarten is about sitting, it's about reading, it's about talking more than anything else. If your child had an instrumental class mm -hmm. last year, mm -hmm. when did they expect to hear Mr. Butcher? Uh, if your child had an instrumental class last year, when should they hear from Mr. Butcher? Mr. Butcher has never started instrumental classes the first two weeks of school. He has spent two weeks usually getting his classes up and going. So I would expect him to be taking the same amount of time this year. If you by any chance are new to Oradell Public School and you're in grades um, five or six and you play an instrument, please make sure you email Mr. Butcher at butcherj at oradellschool.org so he's aware 
that he uh, has another student who'd like to participate in the program. And I will tell you, um, kudos to Mr. Butcher. He's already trying to figure out how, to, how we could do a concert, how we could do a sing-along in a virtual way. For children in a remote program, should parents monitor, monitor them while taking assessments to prevent cheating, or will the assessments be taken with the teacher? In, with students in the remote program, should a parent monitor assessments to make sure a child's not cheating? The fact is, it's going to be on the live day we're going to do the assessments. If we could administer link it that way, we can absolutely admin, administer an assessment that way. So we won't do any assessments on your non-cohort day. So we're never going to give the B group an assessment on the A day. Um, so I think we'll be okay. And truthfully, I think what I would guide teachers is to give a lot of assessments on virtual Wednesday when the whole class is together because um, they can monitor the whole class at one time. Nobody's getting an assessment first. And I think that would actually be the best method we use moving forward. How will parents receive the Zoom links? Okay. So how will parents receive the Zoom links? So in K-1-2, we're going to go to a little bit of what they did in the beginning, uh, what they did last year, um, and it will come to the parent or be listed on a website shared with the parent. In grades three through six, it's going to go to your, stu your child's um, email address. It's going to go to your child's Google Classroom. What we're really working on in grades three through six is teaching our students the skill of using their calendar to put those Google links in there um, just to try to keep things it's a, it's a good life skill, it's a good organizational skill, and it's something that um, some parents suggested at the end of the spring. Will there be time in the remote setting for the kids to interact? Will teachers encourage some social time? Will there be time in the remote setting for children to interact? And that's what I was talking about with the recess time, like I'd really like to get there. Um, it's just not going to be the first week because I want kids to run around a little bit and, and move around a little bit the first week. So. It could, um, I, a parent asked me that question. I thought it was a really great one. I would love to create some situations where kids can just talk. And it makes me think back to when we went remote in the spring and kids ate lunch together. We may not call it lunch now because the teacher needs lunch, but uh, we can work, absolutely work on saying, how can we just talk um, and do an activity that way? And I also, you know, it depends on each of your families too. Like, you know, it, it's important you get to know each other um, and it's important that you find ways to find out who each other is. Like, I think when you have your first Zoom call, you'll kind of know who's in the class. Um, but, you know, if you're comfortable, this is a time to start building relationships and doing things outside of school with some of those kids as well. Will, ch will children in a remote um, participate in open circle? Will children in a remote setting participate in open circle? Absolutely. Um, what we, what, one of the things that we're working on is taking the open circle lessons and um, making them applicable to right now. So one of the first open circle lessons is how do you get in the circle? Well, you're not going to do that in a remote setting, but the protocol might be how do you come to the open circle meeting, you know, ready to be a, a good friend, a good listener, um, a good member of our community. No. <laughs> um, no. We are new to Oregon schools. When will we be receiving the students' email login information? Well, great. Um, so the question uh, was, we are new, new to Oregon Public School. When will we receive login login information? Um, we haven't have our tech in the room. He is working on that right now. Your child's classroom teacher is the one who's going to be given it. Oh, fourth and um, sixth grade. Okay, thank you, fourth and sixth grade. Your child's classroom teacher is the one that's going to be given it and will distribute it to you. Okay, good question. So, you know how our Google accounts are set up, uh -huh. right? So we have email for our upper grade students, but usually for our lower grade students, we do now. Well, for, okay, so for kin this is a tricky one. For kindergarten students, to be able to Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so the, so the question was, will kindergarten students be able to email their teacher? And 
What a, it's a great question. Um, their accounts are going to be set up that they can. Okay, they're not done right now in that way. Correct, Rami? Okay. Okay. So nobody's emailing anyone this week or next week, for that matter. Um, I actually like it's it's kind of it's a great authentic writing piece to have a kid email a teacher. So yes, they can. Um, but I think what we'll do is let's pick a time when we're like at a point, let's teach them how to, because it's a really good life skill. These are really great questions, by the way. And, you know, I used to teach technology every summer. That's how I made my, my summer money when I was a teacher. So I thoroughly embrace technology, but I also, um, I've taught four grades, first, first, third, fourth, and fifth. And I've also been hesitant about screen time in K-1-2. So some of the questions you're asking, if you had asked me this a year ago, I would be like, why would I want that? But the truth is, um, sometimes we have to change some of our philosophical beliefs for the time we're in. So where I would have said, why would I want a kindergarten student? Why would I want a kindergarten student emailing? Now I look at it as what a cool way for a kid to practice some keyboarding, practice what I want them to do in the classroom, which is sounding out words, um, and also do it for an authentic purpose, which is what writing's supposed to be about. A little piggyback off that question that I was asking about using that same platform for email mm -hmm. in order to get the students to have their Zoom meetings. But um, so the question was, could we use the student emails for the Zoom links? Like the In a kindergarten student, um, let let me think about it because here's what I'm thinking. In a perfect world, what we might be able to do is have the teacher set up their distribution list to include one email for a parent, two emails for a parent, and the student um, Gmail account, the Wordle School account, and then a parent could choose whether um, the student whether you're accessing it through your child's email and the reason that might be really helpful for some of you is if you're not the one home with your child it might be helpful that whoever's with your child doesn't have to get the link from you but knows to log into your child's um, Wordle school account so I can see how that could be beneficial and something I want to talk to our our K1 teachers about. Okay. Can kids use a private No. Can kids use a private email address? No, it's actually against, um, it's against many policies, but we have to use um, school email, just like our, our teachers have to use their school email and our students need to use their school email. Will teachers check homework and provide feedback? Will teachers check homework and provide feedback? Well, that's the, again, I want you to move past the word homework to the asynchronous learning part of the day, and they would give feedback on that like they would give feedback on anything else. Um, it's, remember, some, a lot of that, though, is going to be what we can't get done in a shortened day. The research says the number one way to improve uh, test scores later on, um, academic ability later on, is reading. So if it's read 30 minutes and write a response, they're going to re respond to that response. And that's a lot of what we've been talking about the past three days, because students used to write that response in a notebook. So we've had to talk about how do you take that notebook to a digital form? You can take that to a Google Doc but you could also take that to um, a Google slide. And if you do a Google slide, it's almost like this presentation, like we're giving every student a notebook. I just think that you're doing a great job. And so does the rest of the community because we got a really nice message from someone that said, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. It's very well thought out and put together. I'm just breaking up all the questions with that. So maybe you have a simple so, word. Um, yeah. Mr. Hagopian is reading a compliment because I think he was starting to read some of the exhaustion on my face. But keep your questions coming. I'd rather answer them than have you, um, you know, when we don't answer questions, when we have stress, it builds in us and it makes us reactive and that's never healthy. So if you have a question, let's just ask it. And it's, it's really helping me think about some things that we may want to do. And to that extent, here's what I'm also going to say to you. This doesn't have to be the last one. We can meet again and see how are things going. Because yes, 
I can walk outside at dismissal and well, let's face it, I can't stop a parent from telling me if something's wrong. So if we need to find a way to have time for you, you to say, this is really working, but this isn't, I, I'm open to that because some of your questions have made me rethink some things. Some of the things in the spring survey about the special areas really made us rethink some things, so. I think this answer will depend on the grade level. Mm -hmm. um, but it says, with Google Classroom, will the children be able to submit their work easily or will they need a parent's assistance? Okay, so in Google Classroom, will children be able to submit their work easily or will they need a parent's assistance? It really is grade dependent. So if we move, to the um, using the Google Classroom app to take a photo to upload to the classroom. A kindergartner might be able to take the photo but may not be able to upload it to the classroom without your help. The second grader, my guess is, can do both because there's a big jump between um, first and second um, in terms of skill set. Um, do we have class moms for each class this year? Do we have class moms for each class this year? I have to be honest, I don't know that answer. I know we were creating, yes, I think I do know that answer. At last I checked, there were class moms for every class. We weren't sure what they were going to do yet, but I think where we left it with the PTA was we would assign someone and then we would figure out the job responsibilities later. This is a tricky question because we don't even know what this will look like for our students but it says will remote students be part of school special activities such as Halloween and fairs okay so the question was will remote full remote students be part of school activities like Halloween um, or what was the other one like a fair like any like, kind of like book fair that yeah, yeah like book fairs and things like that okay so here's how I envision it now well first of all Halloween's on a Saturday, so we're at all public school would like to ignore it altogether because let's be honest, there's no, we're not parading. So we might come up with something. We would find ways to stream your students in to it. So like if we were going to have an author visit, the author visit's gonna be virtual for everyone. So your student, your child will stream into that same author visit because we're not gonna have large group settings. Let's say that there was um, a holiday boutique. Let's say it was gonna happen outside we would give your class a time to come if you chose to. So we would always be as inclusive as we can, but remember that the Ordell Public School that's going to happen next week isn't like last year. So there's not going to be a Halloween parade. There's not going to be an assembly in the auditorium. For fourth grade, okay. specifically, what was the reason as to why it would be more beneficial mm -hmm. for the class to have one assigned teacher mm -hmm opposed to two teachers, which their hybrid counterparts. Okay, so the question was in fourth grade, what was the thinking behind having them do one teacher? We really saw our fourth grade students struggle when we went remote because there's so much more independence when you're in a remote model and having to keep track of communicating with two teachers was a struggle. Uh, when I talked to the third grade teachers in the spring, the first thing they actually asked me was, could all classes in fourth grade have a single teacher? Uh, I talked to the fourth grade and they, they've kind of adjusted to this model so it felt for those teachers like it was tough. When Mr. Duffy and Mr. McGill, remember, are new to fourth and fifth grade, um, they both have experience in third grade and fifth grade, uh, they, were, they were the ones that came to me and said, listen, we've been thinking about this and they both have incredibly strong backgrounds in math, science, and social studies. Language arts is a little bit newer to them. Mr. McGill hasn't done it since third grade, Mr. Duffy since he taught fifth. Uh, we felt that it just, knowing the personnel and knowing students and the communication, we just felt that it was a stronger model. And I think you're going to find communicating with one teacher because our remote parents do seem to communicate more with teachers because it's, it's not like you're saying, just ask your te teacher the next day. You're, you're stuck in that moment with them. So it will give you one point person as well. So this next question was addressed at our first presentation okay. that we had done a long time ago, but I think it'll be good because it's reference the hybrid parents. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about having a periodic survey for this year to pull both hybrid mm -hmm. programs and remote programs so that we can collect some feedback mm -hmm. instead of receiving individual emails? Yeah, so... I think it's on this last page. Um, on October 9th, as I shared in the reopening webinar, there will be a survey that will go out to everyone in the community. It will ha probably have 
um, some general questions and I could see it having questions just for the hybrid model and just for the remote model. When we did our, um, our reopening paperwork task force, so committee meetings, uh, that was something I chair the Educational Leadership and Planning Committee and that was something we spoke a lot about, like increasing the feedback loop so that we can move things forward if something's not working. And, and sometimes I know it's not working and sometimes I don't. And sometimes parents have great ideas when during those surveys. So October 9th is our first one. Can remote families still take part in picture day? Oh, so can, uh, the question was, can remote families still take part in picture day? So there will not be class pictures in the fall. The PTA will be doing a fundraiser and uh, that fundraiser will happen after school hours, so you'll be able to sign up for it as well. We've postponed traditional school photos till the spring, and we'll see where we are in the spring. But we would always have a time for you as well if you wanted to bring your child here. You are a member of this community, so we will be as inclusive as we can about things. And, and if, I, if you feel like you forgot to tell us about this or we heard this happened, you just let me know. Is there a plan to see, like for example, if there was a confirmed uh, COVID case mm -hmm. and the school was going to full remote for all? Okay, so the question was, is there a plan Z? Like all of a sudden we go full remote for all. So if we go full remote for all, the, the way this plan was put together from hybrid is this is the plan, the A and B cohort, this is the plan because it wasn't just created to reduce the numbers on site. It was created because 25 kids, or I think we had one class last year with 26 kids in a Zoom, isn't always as effective as 13 kids in a Zoom, okay? So this plan will transition. You would stay in your homerooms. The students that were hybrid would stay in their homerooms. The, the schedule for the day would remain the same. You would stay in an A cohort and a B cohort. Wednesday would continue to be a full virtual day where both classes came together with a science lab lesson happened. Um, everything we did, we did with the lens of if we land up in a full remote model, we need a smooth transition. So we felt that this model that we put together was the smoothest transition. This would be a good question to kind of tie together home and school. Um, maybe people are feeling that that would be the case. So mm -hmm. is there a weekly calendar for the full remote students so we know which days are cohort and non-cohort? Oh, absolutely. So the question was, is there a weekly calendar for the non-remote students? It's the, same stu it's the same calendar for the hybrid. And I am working on a community flash. Um, for those of you who are educators, you know that when teachers return to a building, it's a bit of pandemonium because everyone, there's just supply boxes everywhere. And then on top of that, we were putting together 199 individual personalized bins for your children. So my community flash that I think I've probably been working on for four days now has the calendar for September and October. The reason I only went to October is just in case on that survey, um, the one thing we spoke about early in the year um, in our is that some people wanted to know why we had a virtual day on Wednesday and why not alternate it as one week A, B, A, A, B, the next week A, B, B, A, B to increase um, live instruction time. And if on October 9th, every, the, everything's going well and we wanna look at that again, then in November we would start with a different schedule like that. So I do have the schedule for um, September and October and it will be in the next community flash. Oh, he, he said there were a lot of nice thank yous, but last time he said that, he started up with questions again. Um, so I got a little scared and there was like a little bit of a pit in my stomach, but thank you. Um, tomorrow, I will see you all and that will be really exciting for us. Um, I do actually hope that you choose to bring your children with you because we'd like to see them. One of the things that's really important to me is that they understand that it's not just their teacher and them that this administration is also still their assistant principals and still their principal. Um, I will be looking at ways to, you know, do a read aloud in classrooms um, virtually because I, someday I hope we'll all be in this building again and I still want them to know who we are. Oh, see, I should have just said done. Most, the other two are saying. <laughs> okay, I got one more question I hear. Can you show the pickup time again? Oh, can I show the pickup time? Absolutely. And I will also take this right now and put it on the front page of the website.
and I'll go even another step before I go home today, I'll throw it on our social media sites. So if you're, cause I know you're all following us on Instagram, Facebook or Twitter um, so that you can, if tomorrow morning you wake up, you can quickly see it there. And I know you said before, like if something isn't going right, of course, tell us, don't mm -hmm. leave the whole community yeah. line, but remember the first person yes. that they can go to. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Hagopian just got scared about one of my comments because I said to you, tell us if something's not working, but you should always go to your child's teacher first because that's the first person I'm going to have to go to anyway to ask what's going on. So start the conversation there. Um, and then if, if something's still a problem, then you go to Mr. Hagopian if it's in grades K through two. If it's in pre-K, you would go down to um, special services and to your child's case manager. Um, if it's in grades, I'm sorry, Mr. Hagopian's third grade also, K through three. Mrs. Hawley is grades four through six. And I am, I have promised you this for a while and it's bothering me that it's not there. Um, we ha will have a special reopening website. Um, I've been working on it. It will link right from the front page. It will have all of that on there. So. In the spring, one of the things that happened was I sent an email out about if you had a tech problem and you didn't need it then. And then four weeks later, you had a tech problem and you didn't know who to email. So one of the things, is, uh, one of the tabs on that website is who to contact when. There's a tech problem, there's a, a bullying issue, there's a, an academic issue. So that will be there too. And the reason I'm choosing to put it on a separate website is because by law, we have to have certain things on the front page of our website and it just gets to be too much. I'm really done now? You're really done. Okay. Great job. Thank you very much and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow.